Alrighty, I'll just do, I'll continue to share the screen here. Oh, can everybody hey, a thumbs up if uh, we can see everything good? Yay, awesome. Okay, so oh, my subtitles are on, that's cool. Um, so this is a, just a quick guide to writing. My name is Tanya, I'm an associate professor at the University of Sydney. Um, I always feel a little bit silly running these things because it's like, what are my qualifications to tell other people about how to write grants? And the best I can say is that I've written a lot of them. You know, um, Some were successful, most were not, but we'll talk about that later as well. Like failure is just kind of a normal thing with grants, I think. And it's important to keep that in mind. We'll try, you know, try to give you tips to increase the probability that things will work out, but you know, they often don't, and that's not a reflection on you as a scientist or as a person. That's just kind of the, the dark art of grant writing, I think. Um, so yeah, failure is normal and there's a lot of luck, um, but we'll try to give you tools to kind of increase your, your probability. Um, so speaking of failure, I thought I'd just start by giving you sort of the story of my very first grant I ever applied for back when I was a PhD student back in the day. It was a grant that everybody in my lab group historically had ever gotten since the beginning of time. Like it was a given that you would get it. So I wrote my application, put lots of effort into it, sent it away. Um, a few months later, the uh, results came in the post because I'm old enough that results actually came like physically in the mail. So I got really excited, came back up to my lab holding the envelope. Everybody, all of my lab mates were there. My supervisor was there along with three new students, potential students that she was showing around the lab. And because everybody had always gotten this grant, she was like, open it in front of us. It'll be great. We can all celebrate. And I was like, yay, I got this grant. And I opened it and it, you should, I'm sure you know where this is going. It was not a successful grant. It was a glaring failure. Um, I have kept that letter to this day. So I just pulled it out last night to look at it because it had an effect on me. It is probably the most data heavy rejection letter I've ever gotten. They included graphs of your performance and how you fared relative to everybody else, which was kind of devastating at the time, but I kind of appreciate that level of feedback now. Uh, I went home and I cried and I thought about like quitting my master's program. It's like, that's it. I'm the world's worst scientist. This is terrible. Everybody gets this grant. And you know, I'm glad in retrospect that I didn't quit. I said, I took that feedback on board and the next year resubmitted and finally did actually get it. So failure is normal, but especially if you're just starting out, it can be really hard to take. Um, so just as just so that you know, everybody um, I think who makes in academia has failed a lot and probably fails more often than they succeed. And that's just part of the part of the process. So before we do anything else, I'm just going to stop sharing for a second here. Um, and I'm going to pop a link into the chat. And it's just a quick link to, it's got two questions. One of the questions is just which career stage you're at, just so I know whether I'm talking to sort of, you know, seasoned researchers who've put in thousands of grants, um, in which case this is going to be a lot more of a discussion and I may be asking you more questions, uh, or if we're talking about people who are just starting out. So the first question will ask you your career stage. And the second question will just ask you about what you find hardest in grant writing. Um, and I think there's three different words. So hopefully that link works. Let me know if it doesn't. And I'll give you like a minute or two to kind of do that. Tanya, I'm so sorry about that experience that you <laughs> That's just terrible in so many ways. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't even believe it. Okay, it looks like most people have answered. So I will share that with you guys. Oops. All right, so looks like most of you are HDR students, so that's good. 
Cool. So we'll be probably starting off with writing grants. And so we'll talk a lot about that because I found it really difficult, especially, well, I find it difficult now, but especially when I was an HDR student to kind of figure out how to navigate grants. Those of you that are kind of in the new faculty um, postdoc range, you've probably had some experience with grants. So please feel free to chime in if you've got tips or advice or anything helpful, because I, I don't, we can never have too much advice. Like it's, it's really a, a topic that we're always learning about. And then let's see, oops. Oh, can I advance this? Sorry, one sec. As far as things people are struggling with, oh, we've got, oh, okay, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute because it's a little hard to get it to work right now. Okay, well, we'll just go back to the presentation. Boop, 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 boop. But what it did look like, words that were coming up, I'll try to bring that up again at the end when we go to, um, a discussion, but it looked like scope came up quite a lot. So how to decide what to put in the grant, how to make it understandable, looked like it was coming up. And we'll try to cover all of those things a little bit. Um, and then at the end, we can just chat and uh, people can ask specific questions if they have them. Okay, so I think one of the things that makes grant writing really hard is that we're trained as scientists to be science, to write scientific journals and theses and reports. And we're not really trained necessarily about how to sell our science. And grant writing isn't really, I mean, it is about the science, but it's more about how to market that science. And that's a really different type of writing and a different way of thinking about science. And I think we're usually used to. Um, I put a picture of kale there just because like kale is not a great vegetable. Like if we really look at it entirely objectively, it's kind of not great, but it's got great marketing. You know, it's a wonder food. It's really good for the environment. It's good for you. All of that's marketing. And so marketing folks really know how to sell things. And we kind of want to take a little bit of that and use that in our science. So like, how do we highlight the good things about our project? So in this case, how do we make kale something that people will actually eat and even make crisps out of? madness I say um, and that's really persuasive writing that's the art of learning how to write in a way that is designed to persuade your audience um, to do what you want them to do and in this case that's to make a grant a funding agency think that they should give you money and so I've kind of divided it into two chunks um, the first chunk is about how to market your project. And the second thing will be more about how to market yourself as a, as a researcher, because often grants will have a section for the project and a section about yourself. So I think the number one tip about marketing your project would be to know your audience. So the people, different grant agencies will have different selection criteria, different eligibility criteria, and you really need to know all of that. And so before you write a word of your grant, do your research. So look up every bit of information you can get about that granting agency. Some of that is really just the nitty gritty stuff. Like, are you even eligible for this grant? Um, what are the criteria that they're looking for? You know, who and what have they funded in the past? So we talked about the ASAB grants, which are due, I think on the 30th of July. Um, the information about eligibility is right there on the website. So you know that you must be a financial member of ASAB. Things are bolded, so it draws your attention to the things that you need to know. You need to be enrolled as a PhD, master's or honor student, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the kind of nitty gritty things. But then if we look down to the selection criteria, it also gives us information about who the assessors are going to be. And so in this case, it'll be assessed by people who are experts in animal behavior as kind of a whole, but not necessarily in your subject area. So that gives you some idea about how you're gonna be pitching a grant to ASAP. It should be about behavior. Um, they say straight on there that we include, we are interested in the novelty of the project, the quality of the plan, the experimental designs. So those are obviously things you put um, effort into, um, but you wouldn't wanna pitch it to somebody in your specific subfield because the people assessing it are gonna be more general behavior people. Um, and some grants could be even broader than that. So you, you do wanna look through these criteria and kind of get a sense um, of whether you're eligible or not and what the criteria are for selection. The other thing is when it comes to eligibility, if you're not sure if you're eligible, always ask because sometimes uh, grants are more or less flexible than is obvious from their website. So for example, I applied for a Branco Vice Fellowship, which I'll talk more about because it's a great, a great program. Um, and when I applied and looked at their selection criteria, I realized I was going to be a year too old. Um, they have an age cutoff. 
And I thought, oh, well, that's terrible. But I'd also had a baby at two years before. So I, I emailed them to ask, given, you know, given my date of birth and that I took a year off um, for maternity leave, do you make exceptions? They replied, replied very politely back that, yes, they make exceptions, but also I didn't need one because looking at my date of birth, I was actually a, a year younger than I'd calculated my own age. So <laughs> had a child, brain wasn't there, thought I was a year older than I actually was. So it was fine, <laughs> but I'm really glad I asked because I um, mean, embarrassment aside, um, I might not have applied if I had thought I was too old for it. So always ask, you know, there's no harm in saying, hey, can you take this circumstance into consideration? Because grants um, often won't list all the circumstances. So it's not just things like maternity leave, it may be other um, caring responsibilities, it may be a major illness, um, an issue at home, something that may have made it so that you no longer fit the criteria, but if you think you should, it's always worth asking. It, it doesn't hurt most of the time. Um, and yeah, looking at who, what sorts of proposals they've funded before will give you another sense of what kind of thing they're interested in. Um, you can do that by reading previous proposals and often university libraries will have um, successful programs, especially for really big um, common grants like ARC discoveries, linkages and DECRAs. Um, research offices might also have that information. If they don't try talking to colleagues, um, so friends or friends of friends who might have applications they may be able to share with you or at least give you um, some information about the type of grant, or sorry, the type of projects that get accepted. And there is a website called Open Grants that allows people to upload both successful and unsu unsuccessful applications for particular projects. So you can click on those and see um, some exemplars. It's not, doesn't have a super great coverage for Australian specific grants. Like there's only two, I think, for the ARC and a few for others, but especially if you're applying in other countries, um, it has a good list. Oh, I also forgot to mention, but I will, I've will. i collected all of these links into a Google Doc, so I'll share that at the end. So don't feel like you have to kind of copy the links down. They'll all be available at the end of this. Okay, so looking at the website for like selection criteria and stuff is a good way to get kind of a general idea of what they want. But to write a really successful application, you kind of want to do that dark art of figuring out what they really desire. And again, sorry, there's going to be a lot of TV references because I've been watching a lot of TV this lockdown. So sorry, um, sorry, not sorry. Um, and so looking at things like the mission statement, um, any value statements um, that are on the organization website, you know, trying to figure out what their goals and aims are can kind of give you that extra edge. Um, this is less applicable for things like ARC, where they're kind of really well-known grants and they're, you know, they're very huge kind of national level grants. But especially when you're looking at more niche things, um, it can be really useful to try to get a sense um, of what that grant, what those folks are really looking for. So I said I would mention the Branco Vice Fellowship, um, partly because it's a fellowship that I, I had myself uh, for five years. It's fantastic. And if you're in your postdoc or looking to get a postdoc, um, absolutely look these guys up because it's a five-year fellowship. You can hold it anywhere in the world in any field of science. Um, and it's, it's 100,000 Swiss francs a year, which is a lot of money in Australian dollars. So it's a really, really fantastic. There's very few constraints on it. Um, so it's, it's useful. It's, it's got a very relatively short application process. So worth a try. Um, if you were to look on their website for what they want, you know, it says candidates who excel beyond boundaries. I mean, okay, cool. <laughs> What does that really mean? And, and you kind of read through and you don't get a whole lot of information from the who you who um, who should apply page. But if you want to go deeper, if you were to click on, say, the mission statement, um, it gives a much clearer idea of the kinds of people they're looking for. And so it says stuff like we're looking for original and nonconformist ideas. Um, you know, Branko Weiss's model was make motto was make an impact. You know, we want projects that are not merely follow ups or pieces of a large scale research, yada, 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 yada. Yeah, they kind of go on and on and it gives you a much clearer idea of the kinds of projects that this specific agency is looking for and if you can take some of those and even reflect them back in the grant so talk specifically about how i will make an impact because that's Branko Weiss's motto you know or my idea is non-conformist for this reason and it's not merely a piece of a follow-up it's a brand new area of research taking the the stuff that they've said on their own website and putting that into your application can um, ensure that it fits a little bit better with their general um, 
ideas and ethos and, and whatever. So knowing your selection committee is also important. So there's the organization, but then there's the actual people who are gonna be making the decisions. And it helps to know a little bit about what that process is like. So you can figure out how to tailor that application. So in the case of the Branco Vice, um, the selection committee, the directorate are scientists, senior scientists in every field of science. Like they're all over the map. There's no consistency. So you can't write that as if you were writing for another behavioral ecologist because they have no necessary, they don't necessarily have any experience in behavioral ecology. You need to write in that case in a very, very general way. Um, and you need ideas to kind of be a bit higher level. So things that would be interesting to a physicist and to somebody who's a medical scientist and not just things that are specifically interesting for behavioral ecologists. On the other hand, if you're writing an ASAB grant, you know, they, you know that the selection committee will be behavioral ecologists. So you can talk about big questions in behavioral ecology because we care about those things and you know, we're the selection committee. So um, knowing your committee and process just helps you figure out how to gear things. Um, and other grants is grants will be geared at industry in which case you really need to think about what is the benefit to that industry because those are the likely to be the things they care about, maybe less so the kind of big questions in science or behavior or whatever. Uh, also, while you're writing this, keep in mind your, your referees who often look like these people. <laughs> like, most referees are not getting paid for their work. They're doing refereeing on top of all the other things that we're all running around doing. And so, and they're often reading lots of applications. So the Branco vice director told me once that they read 600 applications. <laughs> like it's a lot and it's tiring and they're not gonna necessarily be in the best of moods. So you want to make your application really, really easy. <laughs> for them to read. And you can do that. I'll talk more about how to do that, but even simple things like using bold font when you can to kind of really direct the eye to particular points, um, making sure that you address the selection criteria very obviously. And that can be by using headings and subheadings that really say, you know, benefit to society, because that's one of the selection criteria. If you spell it out that way, the reviewer knows exactly where to find that information and they can fill in their little check boxes much more um, easily. I'm similarly trying to use the same language as the selection criteria. So if they say you need to have benefit to society, then it's useful to say the benefit to society section and then talk about it there. So it's, you know, you can direct people's eyes to where they need to be a little bit more easily um, because your reviewer is probably tired, probably cranky. And if they have to dig to figure out what your application is about, you'll kind of lose them pretty quickly. Uh, and follow the brief. So again, we've been watching a lot of TV in my house. Um, we're very into competition shows at the moment. So like competitive sword making, competitive glass blowing, you know, classic bake off. Um, and all of these things seem to have the same problem that comes up again and again is that people don't follow the brief. Like if you need to make a 20 centimeter long Zulu throwing axe, then you need to make a 20 centimeter long Zulu throwing axe. You can't make it 25 centimeters or 10 centimeters or it can't be a broadsword. It has to be exactly what you've asked for yet. We're watching a lot of competitive sword making. <laughs> um, you know, and you need to follow the brief. And so with my nine-year-old, even now, when she's doing her homework, we keep saying, like, follow the brief. Um, you need to do what you're told. Uh, and that's particularly true for grants. You don't want to miss out on a grant because you, you know, didn't follow the instructions they gave you, even when those instructions are kind of irritating. If they say, we need to see these four things addressed in your public in your um, document, then you need to address those four things. So make sure you read over all the selection criteria and the guidelines and then read them over again so that when you're writing it, you make sure that you're really following the brief um, that you've been given. Okay, so I guess once you've done all that and you've looked at the grant agency and you feel like you have an idea what they want, that's when you can start thinking about your project. And remember that you are crafting a project for a specific grant agency. Um, I, get, I think there's probably mixed feelings about this. I know some of my colleagues, um, usually in other fields, will have like one project that they shop around to multiple grant agencies. Um, I found that that doesn't really work for me um, in terms of successes. I think it's often better to craft the project to that specific grant, which doesn't mean you have to come up with a totally different project. Like it just means that if I'm thinking about applying for say a Branco Vice project, I kind of want to start thinking about what they want and then craft that project to meet those goals, you know, using the skill set that I have and projects that I already have running. Um, ARC is kind of similar. Like I already have a research 
bunch of things that I'm doing, but when I'm writing that ARC, I'm writing it specifically for that ARC, even if it's kind of a modification of a previously existing project, that makes sense. Um, but just taking the same project and kind of putting it in whole cloth to different agencies can often backfire if you're not modifying it to meet their goals and their specific um, requirements and, and such. Um, there's different ways to do that. I find this really useful. It's called the message box. Again, that link will be up on the Google Doc later on. Um, and it's designed originally to help you craft a science communication method, a message, but I think it's also helpful to craft just the marketing of your project because it kind of forces you to think about things more in the marketing sort of way rather than just sort of the straight tell them your science way. Um, and the way this works is that there's different sections. The first thing you wanna fill out is the audience. So we've talked about that already, like who's gonna be reading your application? Um, what do they want? What do they care about? What are the issues that are affecting them that they might wanna see addressed? And then you kind of go into the center and figure out what your broad issue is. So I like pollinators, pollinators are cool. Pollination is in danger. So that's kind of the bigger problem or issue that I'm going to work on. But then what specific dimension of that project are you gonna work on? So each of those sections should only really be a couple of sentences. And the idea is to sort of start to kind of narrow in very specifically on the things that you wanna talk about rather than writing kind of what can become a very big project. You wanna really narrow it down. Um, the benefits and so what section are both about trying to, again, tailor that project to the group that you're addressing. So who is this gun project gonna help? Who will the results help? You know, how, how will their um, lives or whatever improve in the short and long term? Yeah, and so what? Like, why is this project interesting and why should that grant agency care? You know, does it impact them in some way or it's impact their constituents? And we'll talk more about the so what in a bit. Um, and the solution, what can be done to address it, that should really be what your project is aiming to do, right? Like it's going to address this um, issue that you've raised. So I wouldn't use this alone, but I think often when you're sort of brainstorming and you've got kind of a vague idea about what you want to do, but you need to kind of narrow that down, things like this can really help you focus on the core things that need to be in the grant. Um, Crafting an aim statement I find really hard, but it's also really important and it's something that needs to appear really in the first page of your um, application, if not before. Uh, problems that I've seen come up a lot are vagueness, so don't be vague, like always be really specific. Again, your reviewer is really tired and they don't want to have to read four sentences to figure out what you're doing. So saying like, I will explore the behavior of cockroaches, I mean, explore it how, which behavior, which cockroach, why. Um, a much more specific sentence is better than having like a very vague topic sentence and then I have to read a whole paragraph to kind of figure out what you're saying. So try to be specific. Um, the aim should link directly to the problem that you've stated. So sometimes I'll read grants that say things like, you know, my project is really important for addressing how, I don't know, biodiversity responds to climate change. But then the aim will be about studying the behavior of a particular organism and it's not clear to me how those two things go together. So you should set it up so that whatever your aim is links directly back to the problem as you've posed it. Um, using active words like analyze, quantify, discover, it's good because it kind of zippy, you know, it says that you're going to do something and it's a bit specific about what you're going to do. Uh, and make sure that those aims are focused and achievable in whatever time frame the grant is. If it's a one year project, you're not expected to kind of like start a new field of science. You're, you're not going to do that in a year. You're probably not going to solve a really big problem. So you may need to kind of focus that down a little bit. And I think the message box is helpful for that because even if the first version is like really broad, you know, you can make iterations of that to kind of start focusing down to something that's actually achievable in whatever the time frame is. Um, so like tip two, my second biggest tip I think is that the first page makes or breaks your application. And that that was something my, my research office told me years ago when I started applying for ARCs. Um, because most of my applications were like two pages of background because it said have a background section. So why wouldn't I put the background at the beginning? And then somewhere on page three, there was like an aims and then, and they said, no, nah, you need to start strong. That first page has to have almost all, most of the information. Um, and that's for ARC where you have multiple pages. If it's a shorter application, then you need to get to that even faster. Um, you need to be clear and don't use any jargon, the aims should come as soon as you can, um, reasonably do it, and assume that your reader knows very little about your field. 
the the first page or that pro the first bit of the project should address the three whys. Um, why is this project important? Why should we fund it now? And why are you the person to do that research? Um, there's also kind of why this funding agency. Some grants will ask you to kind of say why um, why your project shouldn't be funded or can't be funded by somebody else. Not all have that, but if they do ask for that, then you also need to add why this funding agency is like the perfect source to fund this particular project. Um, so for why this project, this one I find really hard, especially sometimes in behavior because sometimes the answer is honestly just because I think it's interesting. Like it's a cool project because those things are cool. Why wouldn't we study them? But it's not about why it's interesting, why we should do it from my perspective. It's why it's important from your funding agency's perspective. And again, that is really why you need to do your research about the kinds of things that those um, the specific agency funds. Um, saying that there's not enough research or that something is understudied is not a good enough reason. Um, it's really vague. Lots of things are understudied, but why should I particularly care about the question you're addressing? Um, if you can quantify that, if you can use numbers whenever possible, it's super helpful. So, you know, the kinds of whys can be all over the map. So is your focal taxa economically, environmentally, socially, or medically significant? If it is, say so and explain um, how significant it is. So I work a lot with like pollinating things. So that's pretty easy. You can get lots of numbers about the value of pollination in Australia and what percentage of native plants are pollinated by insects and yada, yada, yada. Putting those numbers right in there is much stronger than just saying like pollinators are important, so please fund me. Because um, that's not quantified. You want numbers when you can. Uh, maybe the results from your study will help with conservation or setting management or policy directives in an area that the, um, in an area that's been identified as important by say a government agency or whatever, in which case say that. Um, Sometimes, so you can kind of go the um, inspire technological advancements route, which it, I know sounds silly, but it's actually worked for me a few times, especially when studying things like ant colonies where, you know, the specific ants I worked with, I couldn't really make a case for economic, environmental, social, or any of those, but it, maybe we can learn how to make better computer algorithms by learning how collective systems work. Um, if you go that way, again, you do need to quantify it or not quantify so much as give evidence that that's actually a possibility. So in that case, I did some research in Rio and found out that like certain telcos use ant colony optimization algorithms to um, make more efficient networks. And that's a much better algorithm than ones that have been used previously. So, you know, there's some precedent for saying that we can learn how to optimize systems using nature. Um, so if you can back those, always back those statements up when you can. Um, other grants don't really care about the economic environment significance, um, but they care that you're addressing a big question in that field. Uh, and if that's the case, then you know, say that. You know, this is a question that's been asked for 100 years, and we still don't have a satisfactory solution to it. But I think I, I've come up with the perfect project to answer this really important question. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways of doing this. But what do you do if the creature you work with is kind of useless. And like, I love velvet worms. They're beautiful. The, our group has been studying them for a few years now. They're not medically, economically, probably not necessarily even environmentally significant. You know, they are not an easy group to get money for because they don't really fit into any of those. So what do you do in this situation? Um, I don't really know <laughs> is the short answer. And, and we can maybe talk about this in a sec and see if anybody else has ideas. Um, one approach is to try to link that to a broader question for which this group just happens to be a tractable system. So, you know, there's not heaps of velvet worm species. Some of them are social, some are not. Maybe we can use them as a way of studying social, the evolution of social behavior in a way we can't do in, in other taxa because, you know, we've got small numbers of species, they're spread in a relatively small area, and we know a little bit about their social behavior. Sometimes kind of attaching your taxa to kind of a bigger question for which they're an exemplar is useful. But, and this is kind of the like real talk part, sometimes it's just not the right project for that particular grant. Um, and that kind of is terrible when it's something you really care about. But I think especially for the HDR students and sort of postdoc and postdocs, you know, if your livelihood is depending on you getting this grant, then it might be worth trying a slightly different project or reframing that question or picking another organism. 
um, because it may just be too difficult to kind of market your organism for that particular grant. Um, do also look for different grants. So for example, the project that I ended up doing for Branko Weiss was about using um, natural systems, so slime molds and ants in particular, to, um, to develop new algorithms for managing infrastructure networks and such. I wouldn't, I've never really managed to get funding for slime molds on their own, because again, they're not particularly significant in any of those ways, but Branko Weiss cares more about how like edgy and interesting your project is more than about whether your taxa is itself economically significant. So sometimes it's just a matter of looking for a different grant agency, whereas like, I don't think ARC would have ever funded that particular project. So um, I, don't, I might take a second there. Does anyone have any solutions or ideas about how you market things or questions that aren't you know, significant in kind of the traditional ways? Has anyone had success doing that? Anybody? <laughs> no, hey. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it's tricky. Um, and like I said, I don't really have any solution other than looking around for grants and trying to hook it into something bigger than your species itself. But double worms are awesome. Everybody should study them. There's a side note. The main thing that okay. I have is so that's the kind of that's uh, why your project. The, the second thing you need to address really early on is why you like why are you the perfect person to solve this problem? And I mean, it's kind of terrible because I think it's really it's a weird way of writing to be like <laughs> I'm definitely the person for this job. Um, but that's what you have to do. You need to kind of market yourself as the perfect person, and we'll talk about metrics and things later on. But for that kind of first page. You don't need to say heaps, but you do need to give a sense of why you're that person. And that can be because you have expertise with that system or that question or that group. Um, you know, if you've worked on something for a year or two, you're an expert most likely in that group now, whether you believe it or not. Um, and you can say that, you know, I am an expert in this system, which is why I'm the person to answer this question. Um, maybe you have a specific skill set, like you've got really mad molecular biology skills, or, you know, you've got wicked cool analytical skills or whatever. You know, maybe you're really good at designing behavioral assays for, for a whole range of organisms. Whatever that is, think about what specific skill set you have that makes you the person to do your project. Um, sometimes it's just having a novel perspective. So maybe lots of people in a particular area have looked at this project, but they haven't applied a behavioral ecology lens to it. And you think that that's the way to solve this issue or that that's what's missing. So go with that. Um, Sometimes it's having a good network of collaborators and you're the person that will bring this like power group together um, because you've, you've got a good history, a track record of working in an interdisciplinary or um, highly collaborative environment. That can be a reason that you're the person to do that job. Whatever it is, make sure you kind of low key slip it in really early on. Um, and that can be as simple as saying, you know, um, you know, recent some of my recent research has uncovered this really cool behavior that hasn't been seen before. Um, and thus, I think I'm the person to kind of drive this forward. Um, but do just sort of put it in as soon as you can so that whoever's reading it is like, yes, you're the person to do this project and you're great. And then why now? I don't like this one, but <laughs> every grant workshop I've been to has told me to do this. And I think it is really helpful. It's just really hard to do in a way that doesn't end up just sounding like a lot of hyperbole. Because what you're trying to do is put in a sense of urgency, like this is something that should be done now um, or soon. And you can do that if the problem you have, for example, is increasing. So anything with like biodiversity loss or climate change or basically any environmental problem, pandemic emergencies, et cetera, those are current projects. And if you can tie that to something that's happening um, or that has happened recently, the bushfires, another good example, um, then it kind of gives a sense of urgency, like now is the time to do this particular project. Sometimes it's because there's been a recent technological or methodological advancement that now allows you to do something that maybe you couldn't have done five years before. Um, that could be, you know, new tracking software, new software that's available. It can be a new technique that perhaps didn't exist. And that can be another way to kind of build that sense of urgency, like this is something that we should do now. Um, but it's, it's hard and you have to be a little bit careful because you don't want to fall into the trap of being like, climate change is bad and getting worse, please give me money. You know, it, it has to be a little bit more subtle and you have to tie it into actual evidence. Okay, so that's the first chunk, the project. Are there any comments, questions, tips anybody's got before we move on to kind of the marketing yourself chunk?
I have a question regarding marketing your. Yeah. Doesn't look like um, it. Cool. Uh, is there anything in the chat? Selling, chat? selling your ideas oh, is. Just that... a second. I think Tanya's not hearing us. Tanya, can you hear us? Oh, sorry, I thought somebody was talking there, but I couldn't hear. Yeah, I think she's not hearing. Just a second, and then we can. Mm -hmm. um, can someone unmute and just say something? I'm not sure I'm actually hearing everything. I'm saying something. <laughs> um, ah, okay, yeah, everyone else is muted. I can't hear anybody talking. Hang on a sec here. Let me yeah. check my audio. Oh, there we go. That was weird. Okay, can you hear us now? Yeah, because yeah, before I can hear also Kate tried to say something and you didn't hear, oh, but no. it was probably your... Uh, <laughs> That's really there. weird. <laughs> I wonder if it was the screen sharing that I can't hear when I'm screen sharing. That's weird. Anyways. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, Kate, what did you want to say? Nothing important. I just didn't want to leave you hanging with silence when you asked about um, <laughs> you asked about ideas for marketing the unmarketable species. And I was just saying like one avenue for that in Australia is seems to be the Herman Slade Foundation. They seem to be all over like, I think their motto is almost like stuff you can't get funded by the ARC. We're here to help you with weird natural history. <laughs> um, so it's a really good one for animal behavior studies or can be as long as it's like weird um, but otherwise yeah it's really hard <laughs> yeah i think louis had a question as well yes i have a question about marketing i mean um hmm. we have to try to sell our ideas by linking our um small ideas to a a higher impact things like it is influence on um, policy making or it can be applied in industry but if everyone is doing that isn't that kind of um making it same as other people or w will you oversell your things like it is just a tiny thing but you try to make a huge impact on it yeah, I think I, mean, I think that's that's exactly it. That's that's what makes it really difficult because you do want to stick out from everybody else. And I had a slide that I actually took out that was like know your competition, because I do think it is useful to think about who else is applying and how you can differentiate yourself from them. Like not in a creepy like who else is applying kind of way, but you're know, just having a bit of a brainstorm. Like is it hey, everybody who's applying this a behavioral ecologist? Okay. What can I do that's a little bit different that might set myself set myself apart from everyone else? Um, so for example, with the Branco Vice Fellowship, when I looked at the people who had gotten it, they were mostly like medical people and engineers and there was very little behavior. Um, and so when I pitched my application, I tried to pitch it towards like, hey, what's missing from this discussion about bio-inspired stuff is really a behavior perspective of somebody who understands how behavior works and who understands the diversity of behavior. And that's kind of how I tried to set myself apart from what everybody else was likely going to do. Cause I assumed it was gonna be lots of like, I will cure cancer and I will do like these really big things that I can't compete with directly, right? But what I can do is bring a different perspective. So it's not easy and you're absolutely right. You have to be very, very careful not to oversell because I feel like scientists we're just allergic to hyperbole. Like nobody wants to read that you will solve all of the world's problems, but I think trying to take a small chunk of that problem is the way is one of the ways to do it. So like you know, we might not solve biodiversity collapse, but maybe the project that you're working on will give us some insight into how we can manage this particular species or this particular particular community or or whatever it is you're interested in. So it's kind of taking a small bit that's doable, but then hooking that into something that will something that your agency cares about it's really, really hard. And it's easier for some projects and some tax than it is for others. Thank you. And I have another question is about the scales of the proposal because some fellowship, they fund you longer years, but some small grants, they probably just a year. So um, my question is, how do you decide the scale of your proposal? Because the larger one, you probably come, um, have several big M's and each of them can be a separate study, but for a smaller one, you kind of have different ideas, but you can't put too many things inside of a small grant. Yep, 
yeah, that's that's it. I think if it's a multi-year, like I think I think we'll, the some indication of the scope will be in the guidelines. So if a grant says that we're looking for a four-year project, then you really need to have, I would say, four aims. So usually one aim per year is roughly-ish what I aim for in a grant because four years, there's four kind of discrete chunks that I can do, kind of one chunk a year that kind of works. If it's a one-year project, then you really can only have one main, maybe two if you really squish them in and they're small, you know, aims that are are doable. And if it's, you know, if it's a 10-year project, then you're talking about like, huge developing huge research program things but I don't know of any 10-year grants in any case so <laughs> that one doesn't come up so often um, I mean do think about what you can actually do so don't propose something that's so huge that it's impossible for you to do it um, you know you can be a little bit ambitious and it doesn't it can be a little bit more than it's easy to do but don't don't try to cram like four years of work into a one-year project because the referee will recognize that it's not doable Thank you. So, yeah, welcome. Anyone else have comments, feedback, tips? Tanya yeah, was just thinking, uh, well, uh, something that I haven't done, but I've seen other people do, how uh, that you were talking about marketing hard species or hard topics, that using social media and like Twitter to make hmm. them, make people care about the project or the animal that you're doing. I've seen a lot of people doing all those like vote for the best bat or for the best shark or whatever. And then those kind of gain visibility and uh, then it's easier for you to sell it later on, I guess. Yeah, that's a good idea. Especially if you're playing the longer game, I think that you can kind of start building interest in your critters so that, you know, ultimately when you're going to apply for grants for it, you can, it'll be something that people have heard of and care about. Again, it's easier for some groups than others. You know, if you've got a, you know, a cute fuzzy thing, it tends to be easier than if you've got a small multi-legged spiky thing. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else wanna, wanna chime in anything before we move on? There's a question in the chat for you, Tanya. Oh, along that line. Uh, oh, okay, so someone's asking if it's okay to market one chapter of a PhD rather than the whole project. Uh, I think it depends on the grant. So if it's something like the ASAB grants, for example, which are kind of discrete, um, you know, essentially small projects, then absolutely, you know, talk about that one chunk of your thesis. You don't necessarily have to sell the whole project. Um, yeah, it really depends on what the funding agency is asking you for. Some of them will say we're interested in funding like one small project that's only a year or six months or whatever, in which case a smaller chunk of your PhD is fine. Um, you know, if it's going to be like a four year project, then you probably need to expand on that quite a bit because one chunk isn't going to be quite enough. But having said that, it depends how big your chapter is. I mean, I don't know, your chapter might be some massive thing with like lots of moving parts, in which case, sure. So I probably wouldn't think of it so much as chapters. I would think of it more as questions. So, or questions or aims rather than thinking about how your thesis is organized. So if that chapter has sort of one central question, then that's probably fine. If that chapter has like six questions, then you probably need to break that up um, a little bit. Anybody else? Okay, well, tr I'll try screen sharing again, but with the caveat, I may not be able to hear you when I do that again. <laughs> so we will do a little bit of a test and see what happens. We can, yeah, we can test right away. As soon as you share, I'll say something just to see okay. if you can you hear me? Yes, can you hear ah, me? I can hear you guys this time. Nice. Okay, so <laughs> oh, perfect. But wait, let's see what happens when I go full screen. Oh, okay, cool. How about now? Yeah, and about now. Oh, this is the problem. Ha. Huh. Okay. Oh. That's really weird. I wonder um hmm, hang on a sec. Let me quickly check the settings here. Just what might be the case, and I don't know if it is just it's uh, the only new thing that is, yeah, exactly, the subtitles. That's what I was going to say, Kate. Yeah. Um, but mm. I think it's fine if, uh, if you can keep an eye on the chat now and then, and then we can just send you a message. Yeah, I'll do that and see if that'll work. Um, cool. Let me try just sharing it this way instead of. Mm. Can I hear you guys? Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? No, okay. Yeah, that's no? the subtitles, I think. Okay. Uh, I have no idea how to turn those off. So, oh, like that. Ah, hey, there we go. That's how you turn them off. 
Cool. Can you hear? Us? I can hear you now. Okay, cool. So it that's is good to know. Okay. It's, yeah. yeah, the subtitles okay. are messing it up. Let's just cool. go back to where um, we were. Okay. Um, so that previous bit was about how to market your project. Most grants also ask you to kind of market yourself. So there might be a section that asks you specifically about you as a researcher or about your team. Um, I find that the hardest bit because it's just terrible to talk about yourself, but you just kind of have to get used to it. And I, I know I, I'm sure many of us feel sort of imposter syndrome, like why would anybody give me money? Um, my workaround for that is just to reframe it. So instead of thinking that I'm an imposter, I think ha, I'm an imposter. That's right. You guys hired me, you gave me money, jokes on you. I'm awesome for having got you that way. So yeah, you can kind of change it. And then you kind of feel you know, very edgy and excited when that imposter syndrome hits. Um, but you know, when you're trying to kind of you know, do that, this section where you have to present yourself, the goal is to present yourself in the best light. It's not to lie and be like, I am the best person in scientist, in science, but you do have to kind of sell your, you know, talk yourself up. You need to highlight your strengths. And there's lots of ways of doing that. And, and we'll talk about some of the options to kind of make yourself stand apart from the crowd, you know, without lying, but to kind of really highlight the things that you're strong in. Um, I guess part of it is to be whatever your strength is, whatever you think you're very good at, make sure that you back it up. So saying like, I have a strong publication record is not as strong as being able to say like, I have a strong publication record as evidence by my 10,000 publications, all of which are in top journals like Nature, Science and Cell. I mean, if you if that's true, you, I mean, you probably don't need a grant, honestly. <laughs> like, but for most of us, that's not the case. And we kind of have to figure out how to tweak those um, to put the, our actual metrics in the best possible light. So unfortunately, we're gonna use metrics to do that. Um, there's lots of different metrics. They're terrible um, because they're biased in all sorts of different ways and can go on and on about how they disadvantage particular people in particular groups and they suck. But <laughs> you do kind of often need to use them as a way of quantifying your impact. And so we'll try to talk about how to make the best out of those fundamentally awful <laughs> metrics. Um, oh, something's in the chat. Uh, yep, yeah, I'll come back to some of the questions about um, budgets and things after. Um, right, so there's all sorts of different things you can use. So for example, total number of publications is probably the most common metric that we use. Like I have published X number of publications. Um, it helps to put that into context. So, you know, since graduating from my PhD in whatever year, I have published X number of publications per year, um, or I publish a total of X publications, whatever sounds better is basically what you go for. Uh, but that's not the only thing you can use. And especially when you're early career, sometimes that number isn't that exciting. Like you haven't published a thousand publications yet. Uh, and so you can start looking at things that maybe uh, look at quality of your publications rather than just the quantity. So how many citations have you had in total? Uh, are any of your papers highly cited? Bearing in mind, fun fact, most publications in science never get cited at all. So zero is like a normal number of pub citations. So if you have a couple, you're probably already in the top like X percent of your field. And I'll talk about how to figure out that number later. Um, you can also talk about the percentage of your papers that are cited. So 100% of my papers have been cited, um, which shows my you know, impact, even though I'm still a PhD student. Um, H index gets used a lot. Again, I don't love H index, um, but it basically looks at the number of publications you have. So a researcher that has an H index of five has published five papers with at least five citations each. So it was developed to be a metric that takes into account not only the number of publications you've made, but also how many of those have been cited. Um, again, this will bias early career folks because the longer you've been around, the more time your papers have had to attract citations. So the more, the higher H index will be. Uh, you can talk about being cited in top journals. So all top, or sorry, having publications in top journals. You can use things, alt metrics like the most downloaded. So my paper has been downloaded X number of times. Uh, it's been shared so number of times or whatever. Um, you can look at the journal ranking. So I've published in top ranking journals. Uh, and it's also, especially with ARC, um, they like, 
ARC and things like Branco Vice that put a lot of premium on academic, um, what's the word, sort of progress that you're kind of getting better. They really love things like upward trajectory. Like that's the buzzword. And all it means is that you are kind of becoming awesome. You're, you're in the process of becoming an awesome scientist. And you can demonstrate that, oops, with stuff like grants of your citations over time. And so upward trajectory just means that that number is going up, which for most early and mid-career people is going to be true off, or is often true um, because it, the longer you've been around, the more citations you get. And so the more you start to see that kind of whoop, upwards happening. So yeah, that can be useful if that's true. And you can sort of demonstrate that the number of citations you have is going up, even if it's only a little bit, that kind of shows that you're kind of becoming more and more important or relevant or whatever in your field. And that's an upward trajectory. So all of these things are fine, but they're all biased. And so you need to often put your metrics into context for your career stage and your field. Um, I have a friend who's at roughly the same career stage as I am. Uh, he works on antibodies and like his H index is astronomical um, because people care about antibodies. It's the kind of research that gets cited in like cell and biology and like nature all the time. And so because of the way these metrics work, people in those fields just tend to have higher everything. Um, fields where you, know, you get lots of people citing are, when you, fields that have lots of authors often will also have higher indices because you, know, you can do 75 papers if you're like middle author on all of them and there's 100 people working on all of them. So you need to put all of that into context for your career stage um, when you write things. So you know, if you're an HDR student or a postdoc or whatever, and you have three publications, you don't, don't really wanna write, I have three publications on its own because that gives no context. If you say that I have three publications, um, you know, they're all first author and they've been each cited more than 10 times, which puts them in the top 10% most cited papers in my field. Like that sounds a lot better than just saying you have three publications. So it kind of is part of, Part of the art of doing this is figuring out how to present whatever metric you have in a way that shows, more truly shows how you fit into your field and your stage, rather than trying to compare yourself against like science um, or, you know, whether HDR students comparing themselves, you know, to full professors who've been publishing for like a century. Um, so to get your metrics, you can get these from lots of places and they all have different pros and cons. It's like Google Scholar Scopus and Web of Science can give you your H index, um, as well as like um, counts of how many times each of your publications has been um, cited. Google Scholar tends to be pretty, um, <laughs> it tends to include a lot of stuff. And so you'll find that some of the stuff that shows up on Google Scholar profiles will not um, be published literature, it may be gray literature. If you upload things to BioArchive, sometimes it'll duplicate, you'll get with duplicates. So you'll have the actual publication and then also the thing that you've uploaded um, to BioArchive. So, as a consequence, Google Scholar tends to give you higher citation counts and a higher H index than the other two. That's fine. I don't think there's any problem with using Google Scholar as long as you tell your referees that that's the case, like just in case they check, you don't want them to be like, did you purposely inflate your H index? Um, you can just say my H index is X um, according to Google Scholar and that's fine. Um, Scopus and Web of Science tend to be more conservative. So they'll get they tend to have the problem of actually missing manuscripts. So whenever I look at my profile on those two, there's papers that just aren't showing up. And so, you know, you kind of have to look at a bunch of them and figure out, you know, which one you think is the best reflection of, of what you've actually done. Um, this is just from, just for an example to show where you can find that. This is Albert Einstein's profile. He's got lots of citations. Um, the H index is here. It also gives you like the one, the current H index, full H index, but it will also show your H index since 2016. Um, and for early career pro people, sometimes that's since 2016 or the more recent one is a little bit better because it's kind of got all your more current, current work, depends. Um, but you can present either of those and that's the little trajectory graph. So Albert Einstein does not have an upward trajectory. Just saying, <laughs> yeah, take that Einstein. Oops. I don't know, I've gotten stuck with my, yeah, there we go. So other things you can use to um, get these metrics, there's a software called SciVal, which is owned by Elsevier. So, you know, mixed feelings, but it is free and it's pretty useful. 
um, and giving you just a whole lot of metrics about yourself, like just a ridiculous number of them. And again, that URL will be in the Google Docs, so you can um, get it then. It gives you, is so you can adjust the time frame you look at. It will tell you how many times papers are cited, how many times you've been cited in whatever AM, whatever time frame you want. It also provides a useful thing called a field weighted citation score. And that takes into account your, the number of times your papers are cited, cited, cited relative to other papers in the field. Um, it, it, you can sort of play around with specifying different fields or different things. And if that number is less than one, it essentially is saying you're being cited less than average for your field. If it's more than one, um, it's saying you're getting cited more than average for the field. So that's kind of useful because it's often a way of being able to say like, look, I, Maybe my number of citations doesn't seem big, but relative to my field, it's actually really high. Um, and so these can be really useful. Again, you know, they're definitely biased against early career because of course, if you're newish, you just don't have the time to have got those citations. But you can always say that, you know, I've got, in the one year since my PhD, my field weighted citation impact has increased from, you know, 0.2 to 0.8, you know, which shows my upward trajectory and shows that I'm becoming more and more um, a major person in my field. So you can kind of use those and sort of look at the timeframes and things to kind of really, really maximize um, your impact. It also has stuff like, you know, H index, H5 index, which I guess is your five year H index, citations per publication, all sorts of things. So you can kind of go in that. Um, you can look at yourself, you can look at this for different journals. So you can, you can find out how, mm, what the average number of citations per paper per particular journal is and say whether like my paper in the journal of behavioral ecology um, is cited 20 times, which is 10 times higher than is average for that journal, which can be another way of kind of highlighting particular papers. Um, Sidel also gives you things like um, the number of publications that the number of your publications, which are in the top 10% most cited publications worldwide um, so that can be helpful and it breaks it down by year. So in this, if I, if I was this person, I would say like 2020, yeah, I would use that number. So, you know, there are 30, 30 something percent of publications were in the top 10 cited, most, most cited publications per year, which, you know, is really showing their impact. Um, it'll also give you a number of publications in the top 10% of journals as scored by site score. So Again, this is a way of saying I'm mostly publishing in like the best possible journals for my field, etc. Um, you can get an astonishing number of metrics for this out of this. And so I guess the, the key thing is not that you want to use all of these metrics, but it's to kind of pick the ones that really highlight what you feel are your strengths. And that's going to be different for everyone. Some people have lots of publications that aren't cited very much, in which case you'd highlight the number of publications. You know, if you only have two publications, but one of them's in nature, like that's probably what I would talk about. Um, you know, if you've got one publication that's got a heap of citations, then highlight that paper. Like it's okay to say, I have four publications. Um, one of my publications was cited X number of times, which puts it in the top whatever percentage of the field. Um, it, it takes a bit of tweaking, but your goal ultimately is to highlight your strengths in the best way possible. Uh, there's also other things. So I've talked a lot about publications because I think a lot of grants focus on that, um, but not all of them. And there are other things you can use to kind of highlight your awesomeness. Uh, things like awards, if you've won any awards, student awards, awards for talks can count as well. So if you've won a student award at a talk, um, any previous grants you've had, uh, any prizes you've won, all of those things are, are things you should talk about when you're making your case as a researcher. Um, media engagements increasingly can be used to show this as well. So articles you've written, um, radio interviews you've done, um, TV spots. If you can attach numbers to that to those, that's even better. So if, for example, you publish in, say, The Conversation, you can go onto The Conversation, onto your profile, and it'll tell you how many times that, that um, that article has been read and it'll tell you how many times that's been shared to other agencies. You know, if it gets picked up internationally, then say that as well. Like I've gotten international recognition for my work. You know, that sounds great. <laughs> so if you have that, go for it. Um, invitations to speak at conferences can count uh, and the influence you've had on government or public policy. So if your work was fundamental to crafting, you know, a state's um, policy or if it was used to kind of develop something else, say that. Any advisory roles, patents or commercial outputs. 
Um, if you started international or interdisciplinary collaborations, it's often useful to mention that, that you spearheaded this really cool international collaboration, which demonstrates your ability to kind of work um, in a team setting. Um, successful completion of research grants. That's really important for industry ones. Industry often cares that you can finish a project on time. And so being able to say that I've had a previous project that I finished on time can be useful. And that can include your, your degree. So you can say, like, I, I have experience, you know, managing this really complicated project that I finished on time um, and ultimately was awarded a, a PhD or a master's for my work. You know, that sort of thing is fine. Um, and any editorial or reviewer eh, or reviewer roles for a journal can also count. Um, yeah, so that's that's it. I guess just some miscellaneous things. I couldn't think of where to put other words in other um, places. I think I've said this before, but avoid being vague. So if you can be specific, be specific. Um, you always want, you want to make your life like easier for the reader. So if they can read everything in one sentence and have it instead, ugh, instead of having to read like six paragraphs, great. Um, but do try to avoid jargon. So even reading back what I've written here, there's a bunch of stuff I would change about that second sentence. Um, like I probably wouldn't say aggregation pheromones right away because it's kind of jargony and depending on my audience, they might not know what I'm talking about. So, you know, you can always revise and revise and revise, but you want to have clear sentences and you want to avoid um, just kind of lots of vague statements. Uh, depending on the grant and whether it's something that you actually are submitting a document versus one of those forms where you don't have control of formatting. If you control formatting, then do use that to your advantage. So you can use bold and italics to kind of highlight important text. Um, you can use figures and diagrams just to make it a little bit easier for your reviewer to look at. Um, this is from a successful ARC application. Um, and I mean, the figure is pretty basic, like it's not groundbreaking, but it kind of gets the point I was trying to make across quickly and easily. I used italics to kind of draw their eye to like a summary statement, which is at the very beginning, it gets the aims out within the second sentence. So for a referee reading that, even if they only read the summary statement, they already kind of know what I'm doing um, without necessarily needing to go into all the background. So little things like that and, you know, having box text and trying to make it so it's visually easy to read can be really useful. Um, white space is weirdly underappreciated, but kind of useful. So like having a space here, you know, between the um, summary and the rest of it just makes it easier for someone's eyes to kind of follow. Uh, as for feedback, I think that's, um, see Kate, that's really useful. So ask people for help, <laughs> you know, get lots of help, get a specialist to read it, but also get a non-specialist to read it. So your specialist is meant to be looking for any kind of methodological things or papers you haven't cited or, you know, things you may have messed up that's kind of specific to the discipline, but also have somebody who has no idea what you work on read that because they should be able to understand it and they should be able to pull out like, maybe you haven't made the case very well, or maybe you've been, you've used too much jargon. So get a non-specialist to read it. If you have access to a research department, especially for big grants like ARC, they are amazing. Um, every ARC grant I've ever put in, I've gone to the research office straight away with like my first page and they've read it through and we've had like three or four appointments about that and they've, they're very, very good at knowing how to craft a grant. So if you have access to a research office, you know, take advantage of it and definitely get that help because they are users of the people that know how to write grants better um, than almost anyone else. And the same goes if you have a mentor or colleague who's been really um, good at grant writing, get help from them. Uh, and look for advice online. You know, do get help specifically with writing because writing is hard and I don't think it's something we're all necessarily um, trained in how to do. I've put some resources in the Google Doc, but also your uni probably has a university writing center. Don't be afraid to use it. And I mean, like I've used it. <laughs> you know, it's useful to go in and just get help with like, how do I craft a persuasive paragraph? because it's been a long time since I was in high school and I don't really remember all the things that you do to make a really effective um, paragraph. And ultimately good grant writing is good writing. You know, a well-written grant has a much better chance than a poorly written grant, even if the better written grant has kind of a weaker premise. Um, a lot of it just comes down to how you get your ideas across. Um, there's lots of online writing grant guides um, that, uh, that are useful. And software like Grammarly can be helpful. I use it to kind of pull out just mistakes I make a lot, but don't rely exclusively on it. Like it can never replace have 
having another human being read it over, but it can help you with some of those more um, mistakes that we all just make a lot and have kind of forgotten about. Uh, and then yeah, start early. It takes a really lo deceptively long time to write grants, um, months in most cases. One a bit of advice I found online that someone gave to me is that you should allocate about a week per page. And I'd actually say you should probably, for something like ARC, you probably wanna allocate like two weeks just to the first page um, because that's where a lot of the, the meat is. And that's not even really thinking about the time you spent thinking about the project, that's just the writing. Um, you know, I say this in practice, things often get done last minute because the world, um, but as best you can try to give yourself a lot of time so that you have time to get it reviewed, that you have time to really craft those uh, and make sure you give yourself a few days at the end to spare. So I always in my calendar put in the deadline is four days before it actually is because things will go wrong. Like technology breaks down, things just don't happen. And you don't wanna be down to that like last minute wire when you're trying to get the submission in and the submission system just isn't working for you or a document isn't loading or whatever. So, you know, put the deadline as a couple of days before it actually is so that you have that buffer in case something goes just wrong. Um, and I've already said this, but, you know, if you do get a rejection, which you will at some point, because that's just science, remember that it's not about you as a person um, or as a scientist, it's just luck of the draw sometimes. Uh, but do take the rejection letter. If, if, they, if you're lucky enough to get um, useful feedback, put it aside for a while until you can kind of deal with it, but do read it over and see if there's anything you can do that might help you in the future. Sometimes there isn't, like the last rejection I got about a month ago just said essentially that they ran out of money and weren't funding anything. So like, okay, nothing I can do about that. More often than not, um, you will get some bits of advice that you can use and you know just take that on board. Um, and then lastly, I don't know if this is just me, but grant writing really bums me out. <laughs> and like, I'm really excited at the beginning when I'm thinking of ideas, but towards the end of it, it can get painful. And especially when things are getting handed in and you get rejected. So, you know, do take care of yourself. So make sure you do other things and that that grant isn't your, your whole life because it isn't, and it's not going to be a reflection of you either way. So as best you can try to look out for yourself and look out for your lab mates, especially when, you know, it's grant season because it is really hard and it can be pretty, um, you can bum you out. Um, yeah, I think that's everything except I will post the Google, the link here um, to the Google doc um, just so that we can get that and I'll stop sharing. Oh, no, that's not working. Hmm. There we go. Okay. So we've got some questions. I'm gonna, I'll put the link in the in the chat um, now, and then I'll just go through questions and feel free to just call out if you've got one. Uh, let me know if for some reason the link doesn't work because sometimes I mess up the access settings and I may have to tweak something to make it work. So there it is. Uh, question. So any tips on salaries into grant applications? Um, no, <laughs> it depends on the, nothing specific, nothing general, uh, but it, it tends to depend on the particular grant. Some grants won't let you put salaries into the budget and some will only let you have salaries for people who aren't you. So you kind of have to read through the guidelines really carefully and work it out. Um, also depends on the size of the grants. A lot of grants are simply too small to really include a full salary. Others are bigger. So it kind of depends. Your university usually has a document, or at least Sydney Uni does, and I assume others do, that has like the different salaries for different levels. Um, if you don't know how to access that, ask um, your research office or your library, because those are the numbers that you'll ultimately have to use. Um, and it can be really annoying to calculate because some universities, you have to add 30% on costs onto that. Um, Sydney Uni now has a nice little tool that calculates all of that for you, which has made my life so much easier. Um, check with your university research office and see if they have something similar that just makes calculating salaries a bit easier because it's a pain. Uh, how do you find grants for write-ups and publications and what do you market yourself for those? 
Um, grant write-up ones, I'm not aware of heaps of them. They're usually offered through universities. So I know Sydney Uni, I think, has a write-up grant um, that's offered to HDR students. So maybe talk to whoever the postgraduate coordinator is at your uni and see if they know of any um, university-specific write-up grants. Because those, yeah, typically those are run through the universities. Um, marketing yourself for those depends on what they ask for. So same kind of thing I said at the beginning, like read through what they're asking for. Um, often they're looking for, you know, you usually need to be able to say things like you're getting towards the end, you need a little bit of extra time, but your research will be publishable in high quality journals because whatever. Um, so you want to make the case often that your the publications that will result from your thesis are going to be really high impact um, or will have an impact in some way beyond academia. Um, but that depends. It really depends on the specific thing. So read over the documents that they send you and kind of try to craft it towards that. Uh, question, how can you avoid repetition between summary paragraphs? Yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's a really hard question. Um, I don't think it matters too much if there is overlap between a very short summary statement. So if you have like a sentence at the beginning that just kind of summarizes that, what you're gonna do, and then that kind of repeats later on, that's okay. You wanna avoid just saying the same thing like five times over and over and over again. So kind of putting it in a box or in a separate section, I think kind of signals that that is meant to be read as a summary statement kind of outside of the main document. So it doesn't really matter if the few sentences in there repeat a little bit, like not exactly, you still have to change the wording, of course, but if those ideas repeat, but they're clearly separate as a summary statement, that's fine. Um, at least that's been fine in my, my experience. Um, between summary paragraphs and the main, I think a lot of it is practice and getting someone else to read it because when I started writing grants, I tended to use a topic sentence that was a bit vaguer, like I will study, or I don't know, pollinator collapses are bad. And then I would kind of elaborate on why pollinator collapses are bad later on. And now I tend to just be more direct, like, you know, this many, pub, this many, pub, well, that was actually a terrible example, but now I tend to be more specific in the summary, the topic sentence, rather than kind of going for that vague, much vaguer topic sentence, because I find that reduces the repetition overall. Um, but it really is just practice. Um, some of the resources on that Google Doc are for they, where they teach you how to how to make your writing more clear and more succinct. And I find those exercises are really helpful because they kind of teach you how to avoid repetition um, by being more specific in what you're saying. Uh, some things to do. do you have any tips on how to filter technical details of the project? I mean, how much information? Oh, how much information to include in the methods? Ah, yeah. Um, I think that depends on the grant again. So if it's something like ARC where there's, I can't remember, like an eight page project section or something, uh, you wanna get specific enough that the people who read it will, will believe that you can do it and that you know what you're talking about. So with ARC, your, um, your grant is going to get sent to an expert in the field. And so you wanna make sure that that person believes you essentially. So you wanna give a fair amount of methodological detail. Whereas for something like the Branco Vice Fellowship, the committee, they're not biologists, they're not behavioral ecologists. So some of those really nitty gritty things that I would say in a behavior one, I won't say there. They're not gonna be looking in to see if the nitty gritty of my methodology is good. They want more of the big picture things. So I would still, I still describe what I'm gonna do, but I don't go into as much detail as I would in an ARC where I know a specialist is gonna read it. Um, and also because the Branco Vice has a much shorter amount of space. So if I only have a paragraph, you know, if they only allocate you a paragraph for methods, you can't, you can't tell them everything. You need to kind of focus on sort of the bigger picture um, framework-y sort of stuff. But yeah, it's, it's really tricky. And if you can get a hold of an application, a successful application from somebody who kind of is close to what you do, that's often the most helpful is to look through and see what level of detail they did. Um, and if not, then you just kind of have to guess based on how much space they gave you and whether they're gonna be specialists or not specialists reading it. But it's, it's all very hard. Uh, Tanya, um, sorry. sorry, go for it. 
Um, I have a question about because when you apply the, of the grants, you usually have to submit the proposal, but I also have something like your CV. And I'm wondering how much they care about the proposal and how much they care about your your research strength. Yeah, that's that's very grant specific. And that's one of the things I would be careful to look at before you start writing. Um, so for example, ARC tells you exactly what percentage of the whole overall grant is getting allocated um, to say um, research, uh, um, researcher stuff versus project stuff versus benefit. So some grants will give you that breakdown. If they don't look at the page limits or the word limits for each section, because that should give you an idea of how much they want you to talk about each. So if they give you two paragraph or two pages for a project, but only you know, a two page CV, then they're probably gonna put a little bit more on the project. Um, in either case, you kind of wanna do both. I mean, you obviously you clearly wanna do both to the best of your ability. So both sections should be like as hard hitting as you can, um, but how they'll weigh it just depends on the grant. And some grants just don't tell you that it's tricky. Um, but yeah, it's very, very grant specific. Um, I know some of the Canadian grants, for example, it's like 75% is weighted to you as a researcher and only 25% is weighted towards you as to your project. So in that case, they clearly care more about you as a researcher than they do in the project. Other grants are totally the opposite. Like they care a little bit about you as a researcher and a whole lot about the project. So it can, it can be wildly variable depending on what they want. Um, so I guess that's where reading the, the details as much as you can is really helpful. Um, I have another question that might not closely related to grant writing, but um, it's about the host, because if you apply for a fellowship, you will find a host and how you find a host. And in some grant, or at least I saw one that also evaluate the performance of your host lab. Yeah, yeah. So that's the evaluating the performance of the host lab is actually where I ran into trouble for my first grant. Um, they, they rank you on your research environment and they just didn't like my research environment. What I learned from that wasn't so much that my supervisor was terrible, which she wasn't, she was amazing. It's that I hadn't really written that section thinking that I had to talk her up, um, if that makes sense. So there was a section research environment. I think all I wrote was like, I will be in this person's lab who is doing something similar to me. And what I should have done, what I did the second time was write about like her impact and her, um, the lab group's impact and like, you know, there are this many HDR students, you know, 100% uh, um, of them go on to do, um, to, um, to hold full-time faculty positions. Um, the research head has this H index, which is excellent for her stage in her career. Like, if they care about your research environment, then you need to talk up your research environment more than just saying, I will be here. Um, those ones, you also need to talk about why that is the best place for your particular research. Um, and that can be beyond your research group. That can be the university has these facilities and these people that all, you know, who have already contacted and are really excited about my project. So those ones are hard. Um, depending on the grant, they can bias some universities over others, which is trash, <laughs> honestly, and I don't think is very good, but um, is a thing that happens. But I don't think that means you can only go to like, the you know the top universities in a country it just means you might have to work a little bit harder to justify that university and it may be that they have um, top researchers in the field that you want to do or they have a a critical mass of researchers studying the topic that you're interested in or you know you can look at things like euro rankings and say that they may not be the top university like in the world but they're number one or in the top five in the world for the field i care about which is you know whatever it is you're doing so you just have to kind of craft your application to talk up um yeah your research environment a little bit more clearly uh, and i forgot the first part of the question now because i kind of went on a rant there can you repeat the first thing you asked i guess that's it um mm. I, I was asking about um how to find a host mm. and they evaluate the host yeah so yeah that depends on the grant how to find a host is kind of like finding a, a hdr supervisor i think a lot of it, I mean, it's important to find somebody who's doing something you're interested in. I think that's important, but I strongly believe it's important to find somebody who you get along with, just personally, somebody who is supportive of HDR students because supervisors are wildly all over the map about how supportive they are um, and how much their supervision style meshes with you. 
So some people want somebody who's much more hands-on and is gonna be there all the time. Some people prefer a little bit more independence. That's just a, um, a personal preference, but you kind of don't wanna be mismatched with your supervisor, right? Or whoever your host is. So I always say, just like for when you're applying for HDR, talk to people in that person's lab or people who recently left that person's lab and see what they say about their supervisor and about that research environment. Um, if it's possible to visit, do it. Um, you know, have a visit, kind of get a sense, drop into a lab meeting. We're all, a lot of us are on Zoom now. So, you know, pop in and see whether you like kind of the, the vibe of the lab group. And, and then of course, look at the kind of research they're doing um, and whether that suits what you want to do. Um, again, it is very grant specific. Like Branco Vice is really big on picking the perfect research environment. Um, and the tip for them is that they like to see that you have international and interdisciplinary labs in kind of your team. So for that kind of a grant, then you want to have, you want to contact people in other countries who are doing slightly different things so that you can say, you know, I've got these, these new collaborations that are going to be part of my overall supervisory team. So yeah, just like everything else, it kind of comes down to trying to tailor it to the specific grant you're applying for. Um, and then just doing your best job to talk up the place you want to be. Um, yeah, it, picking a host environment, is just hard. Like, honestly, my, my HDR supervisor, I totally lucked out on. Like, she was fantastic, but I did zero background research other than like, she's doing something that looks cool. Um, and it was just lucky that she turned out to be super nice and super supportive. Um, so my advice is do check because, you know, you don't want to end in, up in some place where you're going to be terribly unhappy. Um, it's not worth it. So it, it's always good to talk to as many people around that person as you can just to get a sense of what they're like. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Tanya, I have yeah. another question. I guess it's slightly similar, but it's more like how to find the grant funding agency. So like whether there are tips or seasons or yeah, maybe a centralized kind of that source or something like that. Hmm, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know if there's any, does anyone else know if there's any behavior specific ones? There used to be an ecology and evolution wiki that was up that had grants. I don't know if that's still running though. Um, aside from the, I'll have a look and see and then um, yeah, let you know if I find anything. Aside from existing kind of listservs and wikis and things, um, asking people is usually a good way to just find out what's going on. Looking on the websites of um, organizations, so for example, ASAB or you know Entomological Society or Ecology Society, sometimes they'll have a page with like funding opportunities. Um, your university should have something about funding opportunities. I know I get I'm on an email list for Sydney Uni that just sends. Um, sends funding opportunities around each week and it just kind of aggregates them. Um, so check with your university and say if they offer a similar service. Libraries, librarians know a lot of stuff and they often will have like a list of funding opportunities or access to that list. So if you haven't had any luck, ask them. Um, and then just ask mentors and like people who've been around a while because often they'll know about the little pockets of money hiding um, here and there. But yeah, those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I don't know if anyone else knows of any lists. No. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, something in the chat. For PIs here, any tips on experience how you applied the grant to start off your lab? <laughs> I mean, I can tell you what I did wrong <laughs> starting up. <laughs> um, I don't know, I think, what would I have done differently? <clears throat> My first grant was a bit weird because it was a fellowship. And so it was the Branco Vice Fellowship and it was meant to be um, that you have time to work on your project. But I also kind of got a full-time job shortly after. So I ended up spending a lot of time teaching. And if I could go back, I would have used some of that money to buy teaching relief so that I could have focused on the project for that first year instead of doing all the teaching. Um, that's probably the first thing. I think if you have the budget to hire a lab manager, uh, I would do that because I found the hardest thing when I started getting you know, students in the lab was that I, I just couldn't keep track of everything anymore. Um, just simple things like ordering and keeping the lab tidy and making sure everybody filled in all their safety sheets. Um, depending on your uni, I think most of them are drowning in administration right now. So 
if you have somebody who can manage the lab for you, even if they're not necessarily a postdoc, but just somebody who's doing all of that, I mean, that has saved me. <laughs> like our lab manager, Eliza, has saved me. <laughs> um, and if you have the budget to do that, even if it's part time, just to have someone to offload some of that stuff to um, was super, super helpful. Um, other than that, I guess just getting, I mean, obviously trying to get students is something you really want to do just so you can kind of get a lab environment because I found it was really hard in the early years when there was like one student, <laughs> you know, and our lab meetings were very quiet. Um, and honor students are great for that because, you know, you can get, tend to get, it tends to be easier to get honor students involved. Um, and especially in the early years of the lab, the honor students were really the people keeping things going and keeping the discussions happening and building that that social environment. And some of them ultimately became um, PhD students. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's hard. I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer how to start a lab properly. I kind of just made it up as I went along and now it seems to be working somehow. And whether that's because of what I did or in spite of what I did, I don't know. Um, but anyone else has tips about starting a lab? Hey, feel free to chime in. <laughs> I like that we're all just like, I don't know, like stuff just happened. <laughs> I feel like that's the other thing to keep in mind. I, and this is a personal view, I'll say. I think there's a lot of talk about strategy and you know all these really rigorous things. I don't know how many of us were able to follow a strategy. I feel like there's just a lot of luck and random things that happen in a career trajectory that just kind of put you on one path or another at least in my case, a lot more so than that I planned stuff. Like I had a plan, it just didn't work <laughs> and other stuff happened and that plan ended up being fine. And in retrospect, I can say like, I planned to have all of these grants in the right time, but that's not what happened. They just just did stuff <laughs> and then and now I have a job. Um, I know that's not heaps helpful, but um, yeah, sometimes I think it's good to have a rough idea of what you wanna do. like overall strategy like you need to have lots of publications and you should probably think of a way to do that you want to have high quality publications and you should probably think of a way to do that and collaborations are great like you should try to get as many collaborators good strong collaborators as you can but beyond that i don't know yep you're welcome. Um, I oh. Guess, oh. Yeah, if no one else has any questions, I guess we'll just give you a, a virtual applause if you <laughs> everyone can join me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tanya. It was really, really nice to get some tips, but also just see how some like like you just said, sometimes it's luck, sometimes it depends who you're the person who's reading your application is and all of those things. So it's good to good to have those tips. Yeah, no problem. And if anyone has questions about specific things that I wasn't able to cover, feel free to drop me an email. Um, if you're thinking about applying for, say, a Branco Vice, um, I'm happy to ask questions, answer questions. I can't, I'm not allowed to share my application with you, but I can tell you about, you know, what I did and just general tips. So yeah, feel free to send an email with the caveat that if I don't respond in like three days, just send a reminder because right now I'm rubbish at keeping up with my email because life is happening so you know yeah feel free to email cool cool all okay, right thank you guys for participating um if you have any ideas on different workshops that you would like asap to post let us know and uh, we're always open for those ideas cool okay so I'll see you in the next workshop bye, bye everyone <laughs>